When coronavirus cases were peaking in New Orleans and threatening to overrun our local hospitals, the transformation of the convention center into a field hospital was a welcome sight. Fortunately, the plans to house thousands of patients turned away from hospitals that never had to be implemented. But now more than three months later, the staggering expense of the emergency center continues even as the patient count dwindles. Investigative reporter Mike McPearlstein and our partners at the Times Pick New Orleans Advocate talked exclusively to medical staff and they revealed glaring inefficiencies, chaotic conditions and often heroic measures to keep up with the crisis. At the beginning of the coronavirus pandemic, New Orleans looked like it was on the brink of catastrophe. Hospitals were stretched to the limit. Ventilators were running short. This is a very, very serious situation, and I know that's a sobering analysis. Relief came here, the New Orleans Convention Center, where a field hospital with nearly a thousand beds was rushed into service. I was there as the emergency center braced for patients. Now I was here at the convention center during Hurricane Katrina, and I can tell you that when the U.S. government comes, they come large. How large? The state earmarked $165 million, but that grew to $192 million and counting. The largest single expense in Louisiana's coronavirus battle, most of it covered by federal money. A San Antonio company called BCFS got the operations contract and brought in about 400 medical professionals from around the country. They braced for an onslaught of patients. Stood up very quickly, um, as you point out, um, and it was a massive, massive endeavor. But almost from the start, things did not go according to plan. Instead of getting recovering patients from hospitals, the center got almost all nursing home patients. In exclusive interviews, staff members, some of whom requested anonymity, described chaos from the start. Were you and the staff, you know, given proper equipment and preparation for that kind of patient? No, not at all. So one of the favorite sayings that we were told was, um, you know, we're building the airplane as we fly it. No emergency goes exactly as, as you planned. It would be a lot easier if that was the case. No sooner did the staff improvise for the sudden change, another trend emerged. New Orleans flattened the curve and the expected crush of patients never materialized. While doctors and nurses working 14-hour shifts in the so-called hot zone were stressed to the breaking point, the majority of the staff had nothing to do. The hot zone was where doctors treated patients, but because there were so few patients, only a fraction of the staff worked there. So with so many of the extraneous staff, what did they do? There was a, there was a lot of people just sitting. We are over by three-fourths easily. The daily patient census tells the tale. The medical staff was big enough to handle 1,000 patients or more, and while there was a gradual increase until April 16th, when the number peaked at 108, it was still not enough to fill even one of the eight 120 patient wings. When the calendar flipped to May, there was less than a third of that number, 33 patients. The numbers decreased from there. Dr. Lindsay Jackson arrived from Galveston in mid-May. I was expecting 100, 200 patients that would be my personal patients. Uh, when I arrived, we had we had 12. Last week, the number of patients dropped to three. The most recent count is seven. Dr. Joseph Kantner of the Louisiana Department of Health said he was happy to see the projections miss the mark. Uh, and I'm really thankful that we never got anywhere close to the 1,000 or 2,000 that we had initially feared. But as the number of patients plummeted, the size of the staff stayed the same. The initial management contract was for $38 million. This 30-day extension doubled that to nearly $76 million. That's a difficult decision to make. Um, it's easy in retrospect to say, well, you could have gotten along with less staff. Just like it's easy in retrospect when you leave town for a hurricane that, that didn't come this way. To Being paid top dollar for 14 hours a day, seven days a week, the majority of workers didn't say anything to rock the boat. The entire staff stayed at the high-end Roosevelt Hotel and meals were provided. Why are you saying anything? You're making $2,300 a day. Shut up and call it. This salary sheet shows that most registered nurses made $243 an hour, while doctors made up to $350 an hour. Even EMTs and paramedics made from 105 to 135 an hour, and everyone was paid time and a half for overtime. That meant that each staff member was bringing in $10,000 to more than $20,000 a week. But even with the lucrative pay, for some, the inefficiency became a sore spot. While some were working grueling shifts in the hot zone, 
the majority had nothing to do. Several staff said some of their colleagues actively ducked work. People were getting off the bus in the morning, signing in, getting back on the bus, going back to the hotel and hiding all day. Just the processes that weren't in place and the colossal waste that was going on. Yeah, it was it was shocking. Robert Travis Scott, president of the Public Affairs Research Council, said planning for the worst was smart, especially given the city's early COVID-19 trajectory. The original intention of this was very understandable. But Scott questioned why the operation remained at full staff when it became apparent they wouldn't be needed. You know, what started out as a, as a no-brainer and trying to be prepared for the worst case scenario has then turned into kind of a head scratcher about why does this need to continue. State officials did scale down the contract for the 30-day extension that was just signed last weekend. Instead of staffing for eight wings with 120 beds each, they agreed for staffing for one half of a wing, bringing the payroll from $38 million to $11 million for the 30-day period. I think it's a challenge when you try and match your resource to what you have on hand, and there's a give and take to that. But in addition to such a large expense for so few patients, the entire operation was caught off guard by the sudden switch to nursing home patients. Um, we didn't have um, chucks and diapers, and so you get really creative with linens, and we didn't have gowns those first couple of days. Even when patients recovered, discharging them was difficult. And we were holding on to them for lack of a, a place to the, for them to go or a place, a facility that was ready to accept them. So we had several in-house that had been cleared for some time, and uh, they were just they were just there out of social need. Dr. Jackson and others explained that an initial lack of COVID testing at the facility meant that even after recovering, many patients were stuck in limbo because nursing homes required two negative tests. And for patients who were especially frail, deterioration set in. We didn't have any activities for them to do either, and so that ICU psychosis started setting in pretty quickly when they're looking at the same four white walls all the time. There were some patients that probably did leave worse than when they came in. Despite questions about the field hospital's role during the pandemic, the plan is to keep it standing through hurricane season, just in case. Mike Perlstein, Eyewitness News. And now our sources tell us that as of today, the patient count is down to four with the current contracts running through the end of June. Now the state told us today they plan to revisit the scope of that center before that date.